computer software magnet Peter Norton contacted me during the mid 80s through Bill Lassero's downtown Los Angeles Thinking Eye Gallery. Peter and his wife Eileen had a very large house and property on Adelaide Drive in Santa Monica near Pacific Palisades. They wanted me to paint one of my artist monuments on an 18 foot exterior wall of their house. The great portrait artist, Don Bacardi, lived right across the street, and we agreed that I paint him. I had him pose for me in paint-spattered jeans and in his undershirt, which is the way he usually painted. Sometimes I had art students of a dear friend, Tony Askew, who taught at Westmont College up in Santa Barbara, come down and assist me for extra credit. These were fast, you didn't take long, and they're good, boy. I don't know any other portrait artist who was fast enough to do two and three pictures <laughs> uh, in a single city. Who told you? Did, did, uh, did Peter Norton say that I wanted to paint you, or? Uh, Peter uh, Norton, yes, it was his and Eileen's idea. When they said they were hoping you would do it, I said, well, yes, of course. I only hoped you wouldn't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, when someone offers me to paint somebody, I do refuse because it's so much work. Mm -hmm. But with you, yeah. it was, it was uh, of course mm -hmm. I'll do it, you know, mm -hmm. duh. Yeah, I think he was 18 feet tall. I had you cut off here, so you're like <laughs> growing up out of the ground like a tree. Uh -huh. When Peter asked me, because usually I don't do people that people want me to do. I only do people I want to do. And, but when he asked me to, uh, to do Don Bacardi, of course, I said yes, I'd be honored. And at that time, I had seen in an article a photograph of Don with, his, with an undershirt, the wife beater undershirt, with his pants just covered with, with paint. Now, I knew that was going to be really complicated to do, but I, I wanted to paint him that way. And so I asked Don, and we came across here in 1991, did we figure? He agreed to pose for me because he was painting, and that's what he looked like. <laughs> it was authentic. And so I photographed him many times. It was so detailed that I wanted to uh, drew it first on paper, and then I covered the paper with acrylic, I added a chemical that would help it saturate into the paper a little bit. And then I put the paper all up, so you couldn't really see it sort of better into the wall. And then we had a scaffolding, and then I just sat there, it came every day, and painted it. And I think that was an advantage, so when that Peter Norton finally moved many, many years later, and it enabled Nathan Zackheim to use the strapple method and to remove it and roll it up. So it has been preserved, and it can go in any collection in any museum of the world now because of that. I was so worried when Norton just told me that they were moving. And the first thing I thought about was, but what about me? Oh. <laughs> Are you no, taking won't. me with you? <laughs> well, he wouldn't, he wouldn't need that behind. <laughs> Kent, I think, was the one that came up with the idea of doing a mural at Biola. We were trying to figure out ways to sort of get on the map, you know, we didn't really have much support back in those days. Kent said, well, I'll do a mural for you. One day he said, no, I want to do a blatant Jesus. He used that word blatant. And of course, we know that he was well established as an underground religious artist. He would do these movie stars and TV personalities and fellow artists and then he'd attach names. This is Christ, this is a disciple, this is Mary. He actually had done a blatant Jesus once before and that was the 111th Street Jesus which is a was a wonderful image I think of uh, a Christ with, with his arms wide open and at ground level. And on the side of a liquor store, he worked with gang members and people from a local Catholic parish to paint this Hispanic, working class, poverty-stricken 
Christ that was saying, come unto me. It was the Christ who hung out with sinners. That's one thing that I appreciate about Kent, is that he has been very purposeful in his following of Christ in his life. And then Kent decided that at Biola he would we'd have a very different approach. Biola was the Bible and is the Bible Institute of Los Angeles where every student ends up with 30 units of Bible or a minor in Bible. Kent said, I want a Christ who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he painted this large scale image of Christ. The scale and I think maybe the demeanor are, they're very different than the 111th Street Jesus, which is very accessible. Christ is looking up at the Father in heaven, and he holds the scriptures, or the Word of God. And so there's a, a double meaning there. He's also holding the Word. He's issuing forth scripture. And this, of course, is what has guided Biola for its over 100 years of history, their commitment to the Bible. I, I think it's a very powerful piece. <laughs> In some ways, the perfect mural for this campus where the things that it represents are so important and valued. Michael Jackson had been a good friend of the Hollywood Arts Council. There was some discussion about me painting a giant public portrait of him on a wall somewhere on Hollywood Boulevard. The council president, Naga Arslanian, and I had discussed the possibility of me painting someone in Hollywood for quite some time. And she knew I'd been approached by... Isla called me and said she had a subject to suggest but wouldn't name the person yet. I said I was very open. A few days later, she called and said it was Michael Jackson. I immediately said yes. I saw him as an old Hollywood, multi-talented, very creative entertainer who worked hard. Also, his music was positive. When we met, we seemed to become instant friends. We were both about 12 years old inside, pretending to be grown-ups, I think. He often called me on his car phone so we could talk about ideas. He saw himself in one sense, as a modern P.T. Barnum, living to entertain people and make them happy. Early on, he asked me who my favorite composer was. I said, I have many, uh, Beethoven, Debussy, Rimsky-Korsakov, Rachmaninoff, Chopin, even Wagner, depends on my mood. I think today, probably Tchaikovsky. He was absolutely delighted. Me too. That was his number one favorite. Later, when we spent all day at his ranch just south of Santa Barbara, I noticed that Trakowski was playing outside on small speakers throughout his property. Originally, he and some of the people around him thought I should paint him in the leather, black, studded outfit of his album, Bad. But I suggested his earlier white, smooth criminal clothing because I would be proposing paint him on an historical building in that fashion reminded me of old classical Hollywood such as Cary Grant or Fred Astaire. He and Astaire I learned had great admiration for each other and he completely agreed. Later I had to go to Sacramento and give a presentation to a select committee for permission to paint on that building. Once they realized I was respectful of all architectural or ornamentation, and the visual was compatible with that building and with Hollywood, I was given permission. Then, I needed to fly to Washington, D.C. and make an even more rigorous presentation to the Department of Interior. We had success there also. During the late 80s, the city of Philadelphia had a fledgling program to try to discourage vandalism. It was called the anti-graffiti network. When they finally hired Jane Golden, an L.A. muralist and a dear friend, the effectiveness of the program began to improve dramatically. She had the idea of having the city bring me there 
to do one of my monuments for American cultural heroes. When I arrived, I couldn't help noticing that everyone else at the city seemed to be getting most of the credit instead of Jane. Anyway, I decided I'd like to paint the great basketball legend and philanthropist Julius Irving. Jane found an ideal three-story wall in a perfect area that needed to be uplifted. And I requested Dr. J to pose in a suit and tie like a great statesman rather than in his basketball uniform. I'm told that the Dr. J portrait did lift the murals program considerably and it also uplifted the area of town that's painted in. There used to be trash piled high in front of that wall, but it was cleaned by the neighbors and kept clean. Plus, a park with grass and flowers now covered that area. During the celebration and dedication of the finished mural, Dr. J's secretary told me that she could see tears in his eyes when he first saw it, that he really loved it. The city of San Bernardino contacted me to paint one of my American icons during the 90s. I thought of Wyatt Earp. He had retired in that area. Plus, I had recently met Hugh O'Brien. And more than anyone, O'Brien brought Earp's legacy to the world with his TV show, the first adult western of the 50s. Then I discovered that the last place Will Rogers himself had performed was at the historic California Theater, which was my mural site. He had died with Aviator Wiley Post in 1935, shortly after that performance. Again, I considered, I considered our distinct Hollywood heritage and thought of asking the actor's actor, James Whitmore, to pose for me. Whitmore had done Rogers in a one-person stage performance for years and was much beloved for that characterization. Plus, I had uh, met his son through the freeway lady, Lillian Bronson, and he had become a friend. I had never met James Whitmore himself. The news of my monument reached Oklahoma and the magnificent Will Rogers Museum in Claremore. I had visited that museum in 1957 with my parents, and it was absolutely amazing. Museum director Joseph Carter and his wife, Michelle, lived on the grounds, and they invited me to come and stay with them for as long as I needed to do research. That, sat that, uh, that settled it. I would paint Will Rogers himself. When I returned, I was given the large back wall of the theater and I designed a singular standing Western Rogers, casting the shadow off to his right. As I was about ready to start, my beautiful wall was canceled. It was learned that there would be construction partially obstructing it. So I started over. I decided to paint two portraits of Rogers, one on the east and one on the west. On the east, I would have the early vaudeville Cherokee cowboy, Rogers. And on the West, the later number one male box office movie star, columnist and radio personality, Rogers. In 1991, during the Board of Trustee meeting at the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, there was a comment made about the fact that this organization represented some of the most respected classical musicians in the world, yet that fact seemed little known here at home. Someone made the crack. We should get Ken Twitzel to paint a monument to the orchestra on a wall. Attorney Les Weinstein announced, Ken Twitzel is a friend of mine. Why don't I ask him? Mitsubishi Electric CEO Tashi Kiyuchi countered with, if he'll do it, we'll fund it. That's how fast the project came about. During the early 60s, I was living in London. I attended symphonic concerts at the Royal Festival Hall three or four times a month, sitting always near the front where I could see the faces of the musicians. It was my favorite thing to do. Painting the LA Chamber Orchestra was a fantasy. I couldn't believe it was happening. I started with the concert master, first violinist Ralph Morrison. When he was finished, I selected Julie Giganti with her violin alone on the narrow left wall, and finally an ensemble of brilliant musicians on the middle wall. I finished touching up that middle wall two days after the massive earthquake of 1994. I'd originally intended to paint a larger ensemble of musicians behind Ralph, but it wasn't to be. There has been discussions through the years about me still doing that.
We were all taking a lot of pictures and it was the end of the day and I remember when that shot was taken that they actually used for the mural because some kind of off-color remark was made and I remember just going like that and of course that's the shot that Kent loved. He loved that shot because it has a certain look to it. He told me later that he likes subjects that aren't smiling. He likes subjects that have a little bit of mystery where you don't really know what they're thinking or are they happy, are they not happy, what's going on with that person. And so I think he was drawn to that moment of that shot. And then there's another full panel of Ralph Morrison who at the time was the concert master of the orchestra. And then there's another panel of a lot of musicians. And I think what's so cool about those panels, especially the ones with the musicians, is the sky is so interesting, it's beautiful. And he's a brilliant, brilliant painter. I can only imagine how many gallons of paint were used. I'd love to know that figure actually on that mural. And so we left and I didn't really hear anything for a while. And then the next thing I know, they're gonna paint a mural from those photographs. Okay, that's cool. So then someone said, you know, I think you're gonna go up soon. They did Ralph's panel first and then I thought, they were going to paint more people and then I think they did they started to paint the panel that's just mine and I remember someone saying you know I think they're starting that panel and I'm like yeah 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 so I was driving we were doing the opera at that time I was working at the shrine doing LA opera with the LA chamber orchestra we were playing for the opera and I remember driving home and I remember looking up and I remember seeing they just painted like my eyes and like the top part of my head and I remember I just about had a car accident because I had no idea it was going to be like that. <laughs> I just remember that feeling like, oh my God. And for me, it's, yes, it, it's, it's a beautiful piece of art, but not a person that's in the public eye like that. I don't have any problem with my violin playing anywhere or doing anything. That's fine. I have my violin. It's sort of like my shield in a way, but when it's just you up there, that was a little bit stunning to me and I wasn't sure quite how to handle that. And I know there was a lot of PR about it and a lot of PR about the whole thing. What is that? And then, you know, people got us confused with the Philharmonic or what is that? Is that an advertisement? Is what, what is that? It created quite a buzz. So I think it's beautiful. I think he did a beautiful job. I really do. He's brilliant. And I, I hope it never goes down just for that reason. My son was in high school a few back, uh, years back and he was doing a project and it was in his photography class. And there happened to be a very, very uh, cute girl next to him who was doing a project on the mural and taking pictures of it. And he happened to say, oh yeah, that's my mom. And she's like, yeah, right, not your mom. She's like, yeah, no, really, that's my mom. So I think in the long run, this kind of publicity and this kind of beautiful art project has impacted the orchestra because it gives it high visibility. Everyone knows about that freeway mural. Everyone sees it. There's millions of people that see it. They're wondering, who is that group? Where do they play? And that looks really interesting to me. I think that's been a wonderful bonus of that. Maybe an unintended bonus, because I think ultimately it's a work of art, but we have benefited from that. <laughs>